already. Kinetic college requires that we point out the fire exits in the case of an emergency. On the lower level, there are three exits in the rear, two on each side, and in the balcony, there are three exits. In the case of an emergency, please take, go to the nearest exit in an orderly manner. I'd also like to ask you to turn off your cell phones, and please rise for the procession. Thank you.
Thank you for the wonderful processional music, including America the Beautiful, that featured singers from both Connecticut College and the New London Public Schools. In her 1929 inaugural address, President Catherine Blunt compared herself to the students, saying, quote, you have all had the experience which is mine at present. You have had a new piece of work to do, and you have been told that you can do it. I pledge to do my best for Connecticut College and for its future, end quote. And she did. Today, we revere President Blunt as a pioneering leader, one with the foresight to adapt the curriculum to the special interests of women seeking higher education, to expand the student body, and to transform the campus with new buildings and resources, including the addition of the Arboretum, a signature attribute of Connecticut College. We welcome Catherine Bergeron as our 11th president, who assumes the presidency during a transformative period in our history, a time of great promise as the campus community is designing bold and innovative approaches that not only build on our strengths, but will come to define the best of a 21st century liberal arts education. We are certain that her leadership will transform our institution and make the distinctive strengths of the college even better known across the nation and around the world. In her first formal speech to the college that opened a week-long series event of events dedicated to our vision of the future, Catherine Bergeron gave us our theme. In that speech, our new president asserted that the success of a liberal arts education is a shared responsibility and then she pointed to the core of our identity in a most elegant fashion. She brought together three simple words that serve to remind us of where we come from, who we are, and what will guide us in determining what we will become. Think, do, lead. Next, please rise for the call to community by the Reverend Araceles Vasquez Hay. Good morning. Today we mark new beginnings. By gathering in solidarity, we celebrate our diverse and creative community we commit ourselves to Connecticut College and all it represents in a new chapter of its distinguished history. On this inauguration day, we welcome our new president, Dr. Catherine Bergeron, as the 11th president of Connecticut College. Together, we stand. We stand like a tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. May our branches be prepared for a touch. Oh, a new and different touch. A touch of encounter. A touch of awakening. A touch of hope. A touch of feeling. A touch of passion. Oh, a new touch of engagement. A touch of justice. A touch of service a touch of stewardship, a touch of scholarship. Like a tree, we are planted by rivers of water. May we bloom in abundance where we are planted. On this very special day, let us unite and recommit ourselves to the best of Connecticut College to think, do, and lead. We, are eagerly, we eagerly anticipate the leadership of a president already guiding us with a vision for the next chapter of our beloved community. Amen.
Because music is such an important dimension of Catherine Bergeron's scholarship, and because the arts have been a central part of the Connecticut College curriculum since its early days, this ceremony includes some special musical interludes. We're going to hear now from a flute quartet led by Patricia Harper, adjunct professor of music at Connecticut College, performing Cantique de Jean Racine by Gabriel Fauré, a French composer who has been the subject of Catherine Bergeron's scholarship. Patrice Newman, adjunct instructor of music at Connecticut College, will accompany the quartet on piano.
In an inauguration, it is customary for leaders from the state, local, and college communities to offer words of welcome to our new leader. We will begin our greetings. Sorry. With the Honorable Daniel P. Malloy, Governor of the State of Connecticut. Thank you. It is a uh, thank you. It is a great honor to uh, be with you uh, today. I understand there's a delegate from Boston College. I could have saved you the trip. I. Uh, <laughs> I, um, uh, it is a great honor. In fact, I have to say that so many people greeted me so, so politely um, and said how happy they were here. I almost thought, well, perhaps they were wishing I didn't come and this was a way of covering it. But I, <laughs> I got this invitation and I very much appreciated receiving it. Um, I have been an admirer uh, of this institution uh, throughout my adult life and appreciate uh, the quality of a liberal arts education which is provided at this institution. Um, and uh, hearing of and learning of uh, your uh, president-designate's uh, uh, selection, uh, I became excited uh, for her and for the institution itself. Uh, she has made a splash from a Lyme, old Lyme High School to uh, 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 Wesleyan, uh, to Andover, to Cornell, to Tufts, to UC Berkeley, and to Brown. Uh, and she has left an enduring impact in all of those institutions in which she has served. Uh, it is a, an exciting day to be with her, uh, the trustees of this institution, the other members uh, uh, of the delegation sitting both up here and uh, uh, in the audience. And to be included uh, in your number is uh, quite an honor for me. I am the uh, failed uh, product of a liberal arts uh, uh, education. <laughs> Uh, deciding to go to law school, uh, be a prosecutor, practice law, uh, serve in government, and uh, somehow win an election. Uh, but I have to tell you that I wouldn't be the person I am but for uh, my years of education in liberal arts and political science and sociology followed by my legal uh, career. I have to say, I, I, I'm not musically inclined. One of the most intriguing things I read about the uh, uh, president-designate uh, was uh, throughout her career, her uh, sticking to and performing uh, uh, music. Uh, I have to say that my favorite uh, band that she ever played with, uh, because understanding she's from a Canadian-Irish background uh, of Catholic uh, uh, religion, uh, the fabulous Rhythm Method uh, was my... <laughs> As the eighth child of Agnes and William Malloy, I am the product <laughs> of a fabulous uh, rhythm method. So I, uh, I, I do want to uh, uh, say uh, uh, it is a, a great honor for us in Connecticut to have you uh, come, come home uh, and uh, lead this institution uh, and do for it what you have done in each of your prior assignments, and that is to leave a bold mark. Thank you. President Bergeron, uh, President Emeritus, trustees, Governor Malloy, distinguished guests, and members of the Connecticut College community, it is my honor and my pleasure to welcome you to New London. As the President-designate has learned, our commentary writers and political pundits have already demonstrated that a true New London welcome is similar to the medieval oath of chivalry. It comes with a prayer, a recitation of obligations and goals, but ends with a slap across the face. <laughs> As the first directly elected mayor of the city of New London in a century, I know better than anyone what this New London welcome feels like. <laughs> Madam President, you have my genuine sympathies along with my heartfelt congratulations on assuming your new post. Uh, as mayor of our city, I'm also encouraged that you have made improving relations with the city a key goal of your new administration. It is well and good that you state that expanding our partnership is a key goal for you. 
it is a goal which we both share. For after all, Connecticut College and the city inhabit this same small shared community. The city of New London and Connecticut College share a century-old symbiotic relationship. What benefits the college benefits the city. What benefits the city benefits the college. There will be time enough in the days, months, and years ahead for this partnership to grow and for its results to be evaluated. But today is a day for celebration, a time for prayer, for the recitation of obligations and goals. But let no one be left unknowing that your tenure, Madam President, will be judged in the final analysis on action and not on words. All of my best and sincere wishes for your success, for your success will be the success not only of this institution, but of this city as well. On behalf of all the people of New London, I say welcome, welcome to New London. Good morning, distinguished guests. I'm here to talk about sports. <laughs> it's Final Four weekend, right? I represent that athletic powerhouse to the north. <laughs> Wesleyan University. <laughs> it's an odd thing to be up here representing the NESCAC, the New England Athletics, no, New England Small College <laughs> Athletic Association. And I'm so happy to have another alum from Wesleyan to be in the conference leading us in song. <laughs> because um, Catherine will find uh, when she meets with her fellow presidents at NESCAC that our combined athletic experience uh, would make a good choir. <laughs> or a law firm. NESCAC is devoted to the scholar-athlete. We are devoted to bringing to our campuses competition at the highest level with also a freedom for play, for fellowship, and for fairness. We care just about, as much about equity and inclusion. Indeed, we care more about equity and inclusion than we do about winning and standings, at least at Wesleyan. <laughs> That's the case, and I trust it will be the case here as well. I can't help but uh, feel just great about having another alum from Wesleyan as a, as a college president. Uh, it, it, it warms my heart almost as much as the the extraordinary thing you've done at Connecticut College, which is to choose someone whose first book was called Decadent Enchantments <laughs> as your new president. <laughs> I know the enchantments you'll find at Connecticut College and at NESCAC will be anything but decadent. They will be playful, they will be highly competitive, they will be at the highest level because of her leadership, her thoughtfulness, her actions. They will put this college and higher education in Connecticut in a much better frame. Congratulations and good luck. It's kind of a hard act to follow. Huh? <laughs> I'm Pam Zilli, a graduate of the class of 1975 and chair of the Board of Trustees. And I was also fortunate enough to have been the chair of the presidential search committee that brought Catherine Bergeron to Connecticut College. Catherine's resume describing her educational and professional background was compelling. Her scholarship, teaching, and administrative positions were impressive and consistent with the experience sought by the search committee. It was, however, our discussions with Catherine that were the most illuminating. It was then that we discovered her ability to listen, to inclusively guide a discussion, to be thoughtful and respectful, but also creative and challenging. Her leadership always cognizant of the importance of shared governance. Perhaps most importantly is her commitment to the enduring benefits of a liberal arts education. 
Catherine has already demonstrated in her first 90 days how well she understands and appreciates our community. She is committed to ensuring that the Connecticut College is, and is recognized as, the progressive and inclusive place it has been from its beginning, a place of excellence in liberal arts education. On behalf of the trustees, I welcome you to Connecticut College. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Loomis, and I'm on the faculty at Connecticut College, and I'm the chair of the Faculty Steering and Conference Committee. President Bergeron, it is an honor and privilege to welcome you to the Connecticut College family on behalf of the faculty. You come to the college at a time of optimism and a time of significant challenge. We have just completed a very successful capital campaign that has set us on so a solid foundation. The college is in the midst of re-envisioning our curriculum to provide students with the best possible education. We are renovating our library to provide state-of-the-art academic support for our students. And over the last several years, we have increased the diversity of our faculty and students. Yet we still face significant challenges. Two of the most important challenges include increasing perception by the general populace that a college education may not be worth the high cost. The other uh, challenge is the effects of emerging technology and what they have on expectations of when, where, and how education takes place. Obviously, these two challenges are not unrelated. In my interactions with you during the short time you have been at Connecticut College, it is clear to me that you are uniquely qualified to lead Connecticut College through our next chapter. Your collaborative leadership style, coupled with your keen ability to assess a situation and present alternative solutions fits well with our tradition of shared governance. I am excited about the prospect of working with you in the years to come, and I'm very optimistic about the future of Connecticut College with you at the helm. Welcome. Hi. Good morning. My name is Libby Friedman, and I am a proud alumna of Connecticut College and have been the assistant director of the Emmerman Center for Arts and Technology for more than 18 years. Today, I'm speaking as chair of staff council, which is the representative body of the more than 600 staff members here at the college. I'm honored to speak for the whole staff at Connecticut College in welcoming President Catherine Bergeron. Staff keep the college running every day. We support departments, programs, centers, administrative offices all over this campus. We work in advising, finance, food services, facilities, grounds, fundraising, athletics, the library, technology services, events, college relations, admissions, the list goes on and on. We are dedicated to making Connecticut College as strong an institution as possible, working toward that same goal every day. President Bergeron has proven that she sincerely values the critical role that staff play at the college. Even before her first official day, she made a strong impression on staff council when she attended one of our meetings in the fall. She asked us right off if st staff received any kind of recognition awards. We immediately knew she appreciated our value. As a result of this seemingly simple question, we have worked in collaboration with her since January in developing the brand new Presidential Staff Recognition Awards. Thanks to President Bergeron, this is the first time in the college's history that staff will be recognized formally for their contributions. The nomination period has just ended, and I'm very, very pleased to report that we've received more than 70 nominations for these four new awards. And the awards will be given out. Thank you. The awards will be given out in a special ceremony for the very first time in early May. Now, on a personal note, I truly appreciate the college's rich history as an alum. I'm proud to have been part of this community since the late 1970s. In my undergraduate years, Oaks Ames was our president. I'm especially pleased to see him here today, as well as all the presidents who have served since then. Connecticut College has a history of very, very strong leadership and I'm pleased and proud to see that legacy carried forward with the presidency 
of Catherine Bergeron. President Bergeron, on behalf of all the staff, I am delighted to welcome you. Your husband, Butch, your entire family, everyone to Connecticut College. We are all committed to making your presidency a great success. The staff looks forward to many wonderful years ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, good morning. My name is Liza Toulousin, and I'm a graduate of the class of 1997. I'm a member of the Alumni Association Board and current chair of the Connecticut College Alumni of Color Committee. Now, yesterday at inauguration dinner, it was a wonderful opportunity to celebrate President Bergeron, but I had the great privilege of sitting behind her family, who I believe she described as loud. <laughs> I would call them enthusiastic. So, just for a moment, the ceremony consists of a lot of polite clapping, for a moment, let's just really honor and welcome President Bergeron in the way her family would. Hands up and clapping. There she is. There she is. That's a Connecticut College welcome. <laughs> All right, now we can get started. Um, I also extend my personal welcome on behalf of my husband, Jorge Luis Vega III, who's also a graduate. It's my honor to welcome you on behalf of President John Denning, Holy Cross Father and President of Stonehill College, where I serve as the Director of Intercultural Affairs. Now, diversity and inclusion have been both a guiding foundation and a growing commitment at Connecticut College. As a result of collaboration and institutional commitment, diversity initiatives are embedded in Connecticut College's policies and programs. The college actively supports the development of our students, staff, and alumni, so it is no surprise that the Connecticut College Alumni of Color Committee has participation and guidance from a multiracial, multi-ethnic, socioeconomically, and geographically diverse group of committed alumni. As a result of this institutional commitment, students and faculty today are the most racially and ethnically diverse in the college's history. But diversity and inclusion were not just evolutionary, they were revolutionary. In our college's history, students of color and their allies fought for recognition, for acceptance, and for equal access to education. And this past year, the college celebrated the 40th anniversary of Unity House, where students, staff, and alumni reflected on both the struggles and the triumphs in the progress of education. President Bergeron, you have joined a vibrant community that has demonstrated both a commitment and a desire to achieve actionable change towards inclusive excellence. And while the task of moving Connecticut College forward is great, you are among friends and allies and colleagues who will continue to shape this community to go beyond diversity and inclusion and into full participation. And inspired by your leadership, we will continue to move forward. So on behalf of the Connecticut College Alumni of Color Committee, my fellow alumni, colleagues, students, and those who act upon issues of equality and justice, President Bergeron, may you continue to be enthusiastically greeted driven by your passion and inspired to lead with your courage. Congratulations. What a treat to be here on the auspicious occasion of President Bergeron's inauguration. I'm Eric Kaplan, class of 85 and vice president of the Alumni Association Board of Directors. Our board includes Jane Worley Peak, who takes the train to Connecticut College three times a year from Washington, D.C. Jane graduated in 1942. For those of you who are quick with subtraction, you realize that was 72 years ago. <laughs> Our youngest board member, Jen Tejada, graduated so recently that she's able to accurately depict life on campus for those of us who have been away for a while. Jane and Jen graduated 68 years apart but like all of us on the board, we remain easily and closely connected because of our powerful ties to Connecticut College. There's a magical element to this special place. As alumni, we care deeply about the college and its future. President Bergeron, on behalf of the Alumni Board and the Alumni Association, I'm thrilled to offer our greetings and to welcome you as our leader. I'd be remiss if I didn't share a short anecdote that's appropriate for the occasion. 
Upon receiving the email announcement of President Bergeron's appointment, I immediately forwarded it to a colleague at Penn who had recently worked at Brown. My email had two words, any scoop? <laughs> I received an almost instantaneous reply to my query that read, Connecticut College is very lucky to have Catherine Bergeron. President Bergeron, as a proud alumnus, I'm incredibly excited about the college under your leadership. I, assume, I assure you that the alumni board and alumni from across the generations stand ready to serve in any way possible as you shape the future of our alma mater. Welcome. I feel a little underdressed up here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Everett Powell, president of the student government, here to give the greeting on behalf of the student body. In honor of our theme, I thought it'd be interesting to tell the story of how I met President Bergeron through the lens of Think, Do, Lead. I was back early during winter break when Deb McDonald in college relations asked if I'd like to meet President Bergeron and introduce her to other students in Harris. I jumped at the opportunity and went down to the dining hall to wait for her. This is where Think, Do, Lead comes in. First, I got there nice and early and started thinking. I thought about how to say hello. I thought about how to walk. But mostly I thought, Mr. Fowl, which is how I refer to myself when I'm nervous. <laughs> Mr. Fowl, don't mess this up. <laughs> and at some point when I was talking to myself, President Bergeron walked through the door. It was time to do. <laughs> I got up, I started walking, wiped my hand on my pants so they weren't wet and, uh, and sweaty. I had a big smile and made sure not to trip. And leave. I stuck out my hand to introduce myself with a good formal handshake from one president to another. <laughs> but something happened then. Instead of shaking my hand, President Bergeron gave me a hug. Gave me a warm, caring hug. Instantly, the formality and anxiety I had of meeting such a remarkable person melted away. And that warmth, that compassion, permeated the next hour and a half of meeting students in Harris. So President Bergeron, on behalf of the student body, I welcome you to Connecticut College, and I hope every camel has the opportunity to hug you like I did. I got really wrapped up in how well that went. <laughs> There's another part I have to say. Thank you. And in a moment, you'll hear from Roger Brooks, Dean of the Faculty, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Ruth Simmons, to create a space for reflecting upon, on both the keynote and inaugural addresses that follow. We offer two American pieces, selected especially for the, this occasion, Simple Gifts and At the River adapted by Aaron Coughlin. These will be performed by two Connecticut College adjunct instructors of music, Maxime Ivanoff, accompanied by Patrice Newman. That's it. That's a very tough act to follow. <laughs> the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you ought to be. And when you find ourselves in a place just right, to will be in the valley of love and delight. Simplicity's gained to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed to turn. Turn will be our delight till by turning, turning we come round, round. Tis the gift to be 
simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, to will be in the valley of love and delight. Those among us who are fortunate to have had strong mentors in our lives will understand and appreciate the impact and the influence that Ruth J. Simmons has had on the life and career of Catherine Bergeron. Good morning, everybody. I'm Roger Brooks, Dean of the Faculty here at Connecticut College, and it is my great honor today to introduce a nationally and internationally respected leader in higher education. Ruth J. Simmons is the President Emerita of Brown University, where she also holds a faculty position as Professor of Comparative Literature and Africana Studies. Prior to the Brown Presidency, Ruth Simmons was President of Smith College. She earned a bachelor's degree from Dillard University, a doctorate from Harvard University. She's taught and held successive administrative leadership positions at Spelman College, University of Southern California, Princeton University, where she served as provost before being named as Smith's president. Ruth Simmons forged her own path, her, the first black president of an Ivy League institution. She was also Brown's first female president. 
During her Brown presidency, she was named Newsweek's Ms. Woman of the Year. Time named her America's best college president. And perhaps most important of all, Brown's own students put her approval rating at the very top of the charts. Her success includes numerous additional accolades, awards, and honors. The one word that is repeated over and over again in almost every article written about her is beloved. A reflection, I'm sure, of her dedication both to the institutions and the students she has served. As a college and university president, Ruth Simmons always put her students' education at the top of her agenda. She moved her institutions forward. She developed programs and initiatives to enrich and support students' education and experiences. She shared the experience earned from decades of leadership in higher education to help develop a strong administrative team. As dean of the college at Brown, Catherine Bergeron worked closely with Ruth Simmons and considers her to be an important mentor. I know we are all delighted that President Bergeron's mentor could be here today to share in this memorable event. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Ruth Simmons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very, very much. I am delighted to be with you this morning. <laughs> Before I start, I have to say how impressed I am that Governor Malloy uh, chose this event and this commitment over the final four. <laughs> Thank you. So Governor Malloy and Mayor Finizio, Chair of the Board Pamela Zilli, past and emeriti presidents Ames, Gaudiani, and Higdon, President Roth and other dignitaries on the platform today. As I said, I am so pleased to participate in this occasion and to bring greetings and the very warmest good wishes to one whom I admire greatly, Catherine Bergeron, 11th President of Connecticut College. Some have noted that although the century was well underway when this esteemed college was founded, its entire first generation of faculty, students, and staff continued to define themselves as pioneers, and they were. This college pioneered in the expansion of opportunity for women in America at a time when such an act would have been dismissed by many skeptics as a threat to the moral and social fabric of society. Yet the founding era saw the evolution of a mission compelling enough to enlist ordinary citizens in a daring effort to promote inclusion and a broader pathway to excellence and opportunity. First-hand accounts of that era abound with exuberant expressions of pride in partaking in such a lofty project. The spirit of high adventure that characterized those days has infused subsequent generations of students across many fields of study and endeavor, forming an estimable record of achievement that proves the wisdom of the founders' intentions. On this day, in the shadow of New London Hall, it would be wise, I think, to heed the lessons of that pioneering past, for it provides an invaluable and altogether relevant guide for any new president, a guide for how to deal with uncertain times a guide to how to lead from a framework of fiercely and honorably independent thought, a guide for how to maintain a pioneering spirit across time and through myriad challenges. So let us ask ourselves what we might find in the heroic story of the college's founding, which we celebrate today, to guide a new leader to inspire in her the virtues that have made the college strong, 
to encourage in her the audacious spirit that gave life to an idea fit for its time and to urge that she set the course for a vigorous renewal that anticipates and supports ever new frontiers. Catherine Bergeron is a scholar who loves teaching, an administrator who issues rigidity, and a musician without an elitist aesthetic. But most importantly, her appetite for the breadth of endeavors represented within a college and the depth of her intellectual curiosity guide her every action. She follows the dictum, therefore, of President Blunt, who urged students to think, analyze, question. In this period of up talk and fast talk, abbreviated texts and emoticons, and reliance on second and third hand information and analysis, one so committed to a deeper probe of new and eternal questions can seem out of step with the times. I am not a dinosaur, by the way. Um, yet Catherine challenges the iconic image of a professor clutching yellowing lecture notes and demonstrates an agility of mind in confronting waves of change. Her leaning forward is a consequence of not feeling that she has all the answers, but rather knowing she must always be in the questioning mode, even when the question has been answered. In the best tradition of this college, may she continue to question, even when students doubt the value of those questions, even when trustees insist that she just get on with it, and even when faculty assert that they already have the best and final answer. <laughs> we know that Connecticut College has undergone substantial growth and change over the decades, thanks to the wealth of leadership represented on the stage today. Catherine Bergeron has the capacity to understand how to mine the diversity of talents and perspectives that now enrich the campus as a consequence of this legacy of change. I think her sensitivity to inclusion and diversity is one of her greatest assets. May she never came, cave in to hollow rhetoric, to perverse tokenism, or to patronizing policies. May she be ever committed not merely to the ideal of inclusion, but to the rigorous ongoing examination of how to create and sustain meaningful engagement with the other. Whether with respect to Gregorian chant, experimental music, or rap, I'm just kidding about rap. Um, <laughs> maybe not. President Bergeron can sing in tune. May she be in tune with the best of what Connecticut College aspires to be, a goal that can only be realized if a leader is careful to listen respectfully to the views of others and admit to the possibility of being wrong. May she continue to practice the skill of listening, remembering always that power more often than not tends to silence the views of others. May she work assiduously to open her heart, mind, and door to dissent. It was no small thing to found a college against the grain and to do it for the sake of equality and justice. Many major institutions have today lost the spirit of their founding and with it the trust and confidence of the public. They may have done so by harboring corruption and injustice, by ignoring the needs of their communities, or by acts of self-enrichment in the face of growing social disparities. If higher education is to escape the fate of sectors that have lost the trust of the public, colleges and universities must demonstrate an unapologetic commitment to the values they have so bravely represented over a long period of time. Independent and courageous truth-seeking, fairness, openness, and inclusion, and a commitment to the overall betterment of society. May Catherine work assiduously to place before you a vision of institutional integrity to which faculty and staff 
students and trustees, alumni and community members aspire. May it be the president's role to be not only builder in chief, principal fundraiser, and college spokesperson, but also chief integrity officer. It is easy today to be persuaded that the times ahead will be far worse than what we've seen. It's easy to think that the coming technological changes will result in shortcuts to knowledge that will make the education we have come to know and treasure irrelevant. It is easy to believe that only those colleges that are made in the image of the select few will be here in another 100 years. But this college, thank goodness, has traveled a unique path. To continue to thrive, it must mine the attributes that have given it 100 years of life and not aim to be a reflection of the attributes of others. May your president represent through the unique inflections of her intellect and her voice, the virtue of charting a unique path. The faculty and students of Connecticut College are pursuing worthwhile endeavors and opening new pathways to a better future. Bringing the college closer to its community and reducing barriers between town and gown, they work closely with students and teachers in the New London schools. They emphasize an international perspective they press for faster progress in addressing climate change. They volunteer with chronically ill children. Yet important as it is to be immersed in the conditions of today's world, a desire to connect to a more distant future is essential. Performing tasks is never enough to ensure a better future. That kind of future can only be imagined and brought into being through the rig rigorous examination of man's nature, a deep understanding of the ways in which societies and cultures transform themselves over time, a desire to create useful and sustainable change that improves the condition of the world, and a commitment to advance knowledge by adhering to the highest standards of invention and discovery. The college's pioneering spirit is part of the magnificent liberal arts continuum that has enabled so many improvements in modern society. This is not the time to declare liberal arts irrelevant. It is time to see that the ideals underpinning liberal arts values and curricula are not only relevant for these times, but urgently needed to stay the dissolution of civil governance and inspire more humane technology. Advancing that spirit to the next level requires setting the bar high, refusing to banish outlandish ideas, and insisting on a focus on the welfare of the world. As illustrious and inspiring as the college's past has been, the future calls to all those who hold this college dear to take from that history an understanding of what is required for an equally illustrious future. The college is on the move. The foundation is strong. Aspirations are plentiful. The students are brilliant. The faculty, scholarly. And now a new leader is called to embrace the challenge of building on that wonderful foundation, stoking those aspirations and inspiring new levels of academic achievement. President Bergeron, congratulations on your selection as the 11th president of this college. May your tenure be challenging, your goals lofty, your interlocutors polite but insistent, your alumni generous, your personal life fulfilling, your song uplifting, and your spirit undaunted by the demands of the presidency. Thank you. Best wishes. Catherine, would you please come forward and join me?
Connecticut College seeks to equip students with judgment that is clear and sound, with the power to think analytically, with character grounded in virtue in its broadest sense, and with the disposition and desire to be active citizens in, in a global society. Catherine Bergeron, the trustees of this college have unanimously appointed and confirmed you as president. You embraced the mission of the college and have accepted the charge to be its leader. As a representative of the trustees, I proclaim you president of Connecticut College. wasn't quite finished, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that wonderful outburst. Um, president of Connecticut College and empower you with all the rights and privileges of that office. As a symbol of the authority of your office, I present you with this presidential medallion. As a token, <laughs> as a token of our faith in you and the responsibility you are assuming, I present to you and entrust to you the charter granted to the college by the state of Connecticut in 1911. I accept the authority and responsibility of the office of the President of Connecticut College. I appreciate the trust and the faith you have placed in me with the help and the support of trustees, of faculty and staff, of students, alumni, and the entire college community. I will endeavor to advance the interests of the college and to uphold its honor. I accept these symbols as visible evidence of my promise. Congratulations, Catherine, and welcome to Connecticut College. <laughs> Madam Chair and members of the Board of Trustees, my dear friend and mentor, Ruth Simmons, Presidents Ames, Gaudiani, Feinstein, and Higdon, Governor Malloy, Mayor Finizio, President Roth, Senator Blumenthal, and honored delegates, Connecticut College faculty, students, staff, alumni, and alumni, all those who are watching from afar, and finally, my beloved teachers, friends, and family. I am honored to be standing before you, overwhelmed by the gravity of this moment and deeply moved by your generous welcome and by the confidence that you have all invested in me to lead this great college, Connecticut College, into its next century. On this beautiful morning, with its long-awaited promise of spring, we are together long-awaited. <laughs> We are together marking a turning point in the history of this college. And at the same time, we are celebrating the original turning point, the founding of this college 103 years ago today. These inauguration ceremonies coincide with Founders Day, 
an anniversary on which we commemorate the signing of the charter that constituted Connecticut College for Women on April 5th, 1911. I can think of nothing more fitting in this moment of turning toward the future than to pay tribute to our past and to those who made our college possible. And so I begin with my own expressions of gratitude on this day. Gratitude for all those who contributed to the planning of this occasion. Gratitude for the staff who made the campus shine after a long winter. Gratitude for those who traveled long distances and those who offered greetings. Gratitude for the musicians who brought exuberance and solemnity to these events. Gratitude for the love of my family and friends. And most of all, gratitude for all the teachers and mentors without whose support and encouragement I would never be standing here. There is something audacious about great teachers and mentors. They dare you to imagine and to achieve more than you ever thought possible simply by believing in you, in your human capacity for becoming something greater. This is a simple gift that you can never pay back, but you can pay it forward. And I feel so deeply fortunate to be leading a college whose mission is to do exactly that. I've been thinking, in fact, about the line from the Shaker song, Simple Gifts, that we heard just a moment ago. It speaks of finding yourself in the place just right. And I have to say that part of the gratitude I feel at this moment comes from this, that I now find myself in such a place. It is like a homecoming. As many of you know, I grew up not far from New London, so both the college and the region have been in my life for a long time. But the sense of rightness I feel goes much deeper than geographic familiarity. It has to do with the audacious belief in human capacities that I was mentioning a moment ago. For what I've come to appreciate is that Connecticut College is an institution that, from its start, dared to imagine something greater for its first students. That imperative is part of our heritage, and it continues to be reflected in the central values that define our institution, in the principle of inclusive education that marked our origins, in the enjoyment of hard work that informs our character, and in the progressive spirit with its openness to change that pervades everything we do. All of these qualities have been here from the beginning. And so on this anniversary of our founding, I would like to take a moment to recall that origin story as a way of understanding our current moment and envisioning the future that is to come. And what a story it is. The founding of Connecticut College is an exhilarating tale of courageous women and men on a mission fueled by righteousness, audacity, and faith. The very idea was born in righteousness in 1909 after the only college in Connecticut open to women stopped accepting female applicants. It was propelled by generosity when New London citizens donated funds and entire tracts of land, some 300 acres in all, to win the privilege of hosting the new college in their city. And it was nourished on a belief that this modern grove of learning, planted on fertile soil high above the Thames River, would benefit not only the city, but also the country and the world by producing a different kind of graduate. The founders, in short, put a stake in the ground and imagined a new school taking root. And our motto captures that image. In Latin, it reads, tan quam lignum quod plantatum est, secus de cursus aquarum, like a cutting transplanted by a river. It's a biblical reference taken from the first psalm, and it's taken out of context, so it's worth remembering how the whole psalm goes. Loosely paraphrased, it begins, blessed is the man who has not followed the path of the wicked or sat in the scornful place, for only the righteous will grow upright like a cutting transplanted by a river that becomes a tree, bears fruit, and never withers. In short, everything will flourish and prosper. That's a very loose translation, but it gives a sense 
of the oppositional stance of the text, and perhaps of the original founders themselves who sought to right a wrong. The gender of the psalm is reversed too, for the cutting that will become a tree is in this case a nourishing mother, the alma mater. I am most interested though in the twin symbolism of wood and water, tree and river, one signaling stability, the other movement. We are blessed, of course, with a real river and many, many beautiful trees on our Arboretum campus, so it is tempting to read our motto literally. But the flow of water, de cursus aquarum, also signals something else, a restlessness and a propensity for change that is written, I think, into our DNA. And it makes sense if you think about our founding year, 1911. It was the progressive era, a time of great technological and social instability and mobility, one with important implications for the status of women. The progressives believed in the power of science, technology, and especially education to address the social problems of the day. And so the founders imagined a new curriculum that combined the rigors of the traditional liberal arts with practical training that would prepare graduates to enter the workforce in meaningful ways. They imagined, in short, a new generation of thinkers, doers, and leaders, women who were intellectually adept, mindful of their civic responsibility, equipped with real-world skills, and ready to contribute to the public sphere. Thinkers, doers, leaders. I am struck by how much this modern concept from 1911 is still germane today. For we live in a time marked by the same mix of disruption and opportunity that our forebears experienced a century ago. If they saw advances in automobiles and aviation, we see drones and self-driving cars. If they watched in wonder at wireless telegraphy and moving pictures, we marvel at the power of social media and cloud computing. If they heard debates over universal suffrage, we argue over universal health care and our failing schools. The terms may have changed, but the issues have persisted. And just as Connecticut College has prospered and flourished over the last century, growing in size and in stature, so too has the need for the thoughtful, versatile, and socially responsible graduates we produce. Indeed, I would argue that need has never been more urgent. It can be hard, of course, to sense this urgency over the noise of an ever-growing chorus of skeptics who question the value of what colleges like ours do. We hear protests about overspending and waste. We hear exclamations over student debt. We hear insinuations about useless degrees. The claims come, however, at a time when the technological expansion and sophistication of the service professions has made the earning of an advanced degree more necessary, not less. They come at a time when the requirements of our public and charter schools has made nuanced and inclusive teacher training more vital, not less. They come at a time when the survival of our cultural institutions has made flexible and creative leadership skills more important, not less. They come at a time when the dictates of both diplomacy and commerce have made advanced proficiency in more than one world language more critical, not less. They come, indeed, at a time when the survival of our liberal democracy has made the heightened capacity for complex thinking, for personal integrity, and for empathy, the outcomes traditionally associated with a liberal education, more essential to our future, not less. And so, although I know I take on the mantle of this new responsibility at a time of great challenge, for, not just for higher education, but for our communities, our country, and our world, I do so with a conviction that the education that we offer here at Connecticut College and the graduates we produce through that education will be part of the solution. For our graduates have shown this capacity for a very long time. They have been part of the solution. 
They have been leaders in the arts, like Agnes Gunt, who presided over New York's Museum of Modern Art during one of its most dazzling periods. Or Sean Fine, who has brought the same qualities of empathy and humanity that define our campus into his documentary films. They have been leaders in the environment, like Wendy Blake Coleman, whose long career at the US Environmental Protection Agency now involves monitoring vital geospatial data to identify environmental and security risks, or David Barber, whose award-winning Blue Hill restaurant spearheaded the farm-to-table movement. They've been leaders in government, like Patricia Walt, whose distinguished career as a federal judge included service on the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, or Debo Adegbile, who has served his country ably and admirably as counsel to the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund and to the US Senate Judiciary Committee. They have been leaders in education, like Mary Lake Polin, a physician and teacher who was lauded for her work with women patients and doctors in Eritrea, or Ed Berger, a nationally recognized professor of mathematics who was just last week inaugurated as the 15th president of Southwestern University. Of course, I could go on, but my point is that our graduates have been able to achieve all this because of their Connecticut college education, which dared them to think and do and lead, to develop their intellectual and creative capacities, to make the connection between the campus and the world, and to see their learning as an opportunity to make a meaningful contribution to society, to pay their debt forward. This, as I said, has been part of the college's legacy from the very beginning. Today, we have a simple name for it. We like to call it the liberal arts in action. As I walk about this campus and meet with faculty and students and staff, I see evidence of this mission everywhere I turn. I see it in the staff who are not only serving the needs of the campus, but also serving on boards in the local community. I see it in the faculty who are not only engaged in their own teaching and research, but also engaged in service so vital to the governing of the college. I see it in students who are not only committed to their studies and their sports, but also committed to teaching in our community schools, or conducting independent research, or mounting conferences or performances, or excelling in internships here and abroad, or making films to end oppression and violence, or joining NGOs to change the world. A recent study showed, in fact, that students at Connecticut College were far more likely than students at peer institutions to define the return on their educational investment in terms of giving back rather than getting ahead. In other words, our students already see themselves as part of the solution. This, visit, this vision is so important that our faculty, too, has been at work over the last year to make our commitment to such outcomes even more explicit in our requirements. They have set out to create a new curriculum for Connecticut College, a curriculum with the same progressive spirit and the same values of inclusiveness and rigor that motivated our forebears a century ago. In short, an audacious curriculum for the 21st century that will dare our students to become the creative, thoughtful, adept, and socially responsible leaders of our future. I arrive at Connecticut College then in a time of great opportunity and great hope. And as I look toward our future, on this commemoration of our founding, I see several areas in which the college must advance in order to ensure that we continue to flourish and prosper in the next century. First, and most importantly, we must advance the excellence of our faculty and all our academic programs and centers leveraging our historic strengths in the sciences, the social sciences, the humanities, and the arts in order to ensure the highest standards of teaching and scholarship, to nurture the intellectual and creative capacities of our students, and to make the distinctions of a Connecticut College education even more widely known across the country and the world. 
We must advance our financial aid programs to broaden the access of qualified applicants to our college, and we must continue to expand the diversity of our student and faculty ranks in order to foster a truly inclusive culture of excellence. We must advance the outcomes of a Connecticut college education in order to support the continuing success of our graduates in their lives after college and to claim our rightful place as a leader in liberal and career-oriented learning. And finally, we must advance our connections to the local community in order to deepen our impact and extend the opportunities for real-world learning. We must advance as well the global aspirations of the college through new programs and new technologies in order to expand the reach and the relevance of a Connecticut college education in the world. Academic excellence, access, outcomes, and impact. This will be a challenging agenda to be sure, requiring the support of many people. But I am buoyed by the knowledge that I will not be alone heartened by the striving spirit of our community and inspired by the legacy of many great presidents over the last century, presidents who were themselves transplanted to this place by a river and who during their tenure oversaw the efflorescence of the college from a, true, from a shoot to a tree to an ever-expanding canopy of knowledge and opportunity. For that is the story we commemorate today, the story, the miracle, really, of education. I spoke earlier of the audacity of great teachers and mentors who dare you to become more than you thought you could become. And as I reflect on that history within the college, I recall with reverence a long line of teachers who challenged me in the very same way from professional mentors like Ruth Simmons, to graduate advisors like Roger Parker, to college instructors like Richard Winslow, to high school teachers like Alice Burbank and Elias Hage and Patricia Harper, most of whom are present at this celebration today. I also think, of course, about my family. Your family is always your first and most important teacher. And so, in addition to my parents and siblings, I think about my grandparents and their parents, transplanted from Canada by means of the long Connecticut River. They never attended college, but through their own hard work and striving, they passed on this value by challenging themselves and their children and their children's children to expand their human capacities through ever-widening opportunities for education. I have been carried along the same river of hope and nourished by the same tree of learning. And now it is my great good fortune to be able to cultivate that fertile garden for the next generation. And so, with gratitude for my family, deep respect for my teachers, appreciation for my new colleagues, and anticipated joy for the future students who will be transplanted to this place, students who will grow to become more than we could ever dream, I humbly accept the responsibility of leading Connecticut College into its second abundant century. Thank you very much. Please stand.
and join in singing our alma mater. The words can be found on page 11 of your program. We'll begin um, by being led by students Julian Gordon and Philip Paselli, accompanied by Patrice Newman. Afterward, please remain standing as the Reverend Robert Washabaugh, our college chaplain, delivers the benediction. but I want to preface it. U.S. Grant, the Civil War general, was the 18th president of the Republic. He had a few personal defects. He drank too much and he smoked seven to 10 cigars a day. He had a lot of stress. But he also had a tin ear. He couldn't hear music very well. He said he knew only two songs. One was Yankee Doodle and the other wasn't. <laughs> now, George Gershwin was the opposite. He could hear melodies everywhere. He could hear music in everyday sounds. One day at a breakfast diner, he heard the waitress call out, an order of sausage and eggs. And he heard and then wrote down the melody line of it ain't necessarily so. <laughs> you might say that like General Grant, we are surrounded by music that we fail to hear. But that music is there. So let me invite you to join me in calling out a kind of prayer to what surrounds us and penetrates us. We call on that great mystery of future possibility, barely perceived, that sweet singer, mysteriously beyond us but tantalizingly close to us. Whether you choose, as I do, to call that wealth God, or you choose to call it something else, say, the void or no thing, 
it doesn't matter so much to me. We are all here standing to call on it. And we do so with one heart, just for a moment in silence. O oh God, out of your wealth, the delight of something new comes to be. In this marvelous time of inauguration, open our senses and our intellects to possibilities now within reach. May President Bergeron hear in everyday noise themes that will awaken and give life to this great institution. Let her time as president here be not merely a sequence of years, a few turns around the racetrack, but a gracious time of listening to what can be and making those possibilities audible, visible, tangible. May we all be picking up good vibrations. May we listen attentively so that the culture of this school may rise fresh, alive, new. May we be both be surprised by new insights and reminded of important things half forgotten. May that culture be nurtured and displayed as a kind of harmony brought about by many voices that speak and listen together. May every professor, every instructor, every student, each dean, administrator, counselor, chaplain, coach, food handler, and floor sweeper be an integral part of the creation through what they say and do, through what they hear and how they hear it. May each learner who comes here, each one a unique combination of gifts, needs, ambitions, perspectives, find his or her rich potentiality brought to the surface and made real for the greater good. On this day, we ask blessing most of all for the new president, the 11th of this college, Catherine Bergeron. Let her hear your voice in the many wise voices that are among us. And let us hear the wisdom that is in her voice. And let a sense of things unfolding and opening up show in all we do together. Optimism, enthusiasm, possibility. Let these, O oh God, mark this time for her and for us all. For what comes to be written isn't just from her, isn't just from us. It is from you. Amen. Please remain at your seats for the recessional, which will include three pieces led by Connecticut College faculty members Gary Buttery and John Clark, along with Mark Peel, the college's piano technician. Thank you. 
Thank <laughs> you. 